Well, greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. I'd like to begin by sharing a portion of Psalm 111. And in Psalm 111, we see a great hallelujah psalm. And in, it, it's, it, it, it commends us to corporate worship, to be together and to praise the Lord together. Praising the Lord and praying alone is very important. Together is also super important. So we're so glad to be together today. Let me read a portion of Psalm 111. It says, Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. And then it ends like this. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And all who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Amen. Amen. I direct your attention to the silent prayer as the prelude is shared with us. And I pray the Lord richly bless you today. Amen.
please rise for the invocation. We begin this holy day of worship in the name of the Father, the Son who redeemed our body and soul from eternal death, and the Holy Spirit who keeps us in harmony with our Creator. Amen. He made the world. His goodness shines as the sun. Jesus said, My Father has prepared a great wedding banquet, and we have been invited. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him glory. Jesus wore our flesh. He took our curse upon the cross. He bore the wrath of God for our broken commandments. He reconciled our souls to God. We rejoice and give glory and honor to our King. He has invited us, his church, to be his bride. Give glory to the coming King of Kings. He has promised to make all things new. The fallen world, like fallen people, await his return in glory. Our citizenship is in heaven. We will be watchful. We will be faithful while we wait for his return. Take a moment of silence for personal reflection and confession. We continue. God's eternal plan from the beginning of creation was to restore peace and harmony with all humanity. Jesus became the sacrificial lamb of God for us. His death on the cross has removed God's wrath against sin. His resurrection from the grave assures us of God's mercy and grace. He has opened the gate to heaven for all who accept his grace and mercy. If we claim that we have not broken God's commandments, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. O oh Lord, if you kept a record of our broken commandments, no one could stand in your holy presence. In your grace, you have offered forgiveness to all who kneel at the cross of Jesus. If we confess our failures, our broken ethical standards, you will forgive us. Your love is unfailing. Blot out all my transgressions, shameful and evil thoughts and actions. Wash away my selfishness. I know that my broken commandments, my failure to serve others as you have asked, separates me from your holy presence. I have failed to love others as you have loved me. Take out my stony heart of sin and give me a heart of love so that I might reflect your love. Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. He hears our cry for mercy. He has brought us back as friends by reconciling us to himself through the death and resurrection of Jesus. You see, at just the right time when we were powerless to save ourselves, Jesus died for us, taking the punishment of God's wrath against sin that we deserved. O Lord of grace and mercy, Grant us your forgiveness by faith in Jesus. Dear friends, do not let your hearts be troubled. It is true that your behavior once alienated you from peace with God that your heart desires. But God brought you back as his friends by the death and resurrection of Jesus. God has restored you. When you shelter in the arms of Jesus, God sees you without blemish, holy in his sight free from accusation if you continue in your faith in his death and resurrection. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, the risen Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. That's a great amen. We're forgiven. We're forgiven. <coughs> Our first lesson from the Old Testament comes from the book of Ruth, the first chapter beginning in verse 1. And whether you are prospering or struggling, as we see in this, look to the word where there's wisdom for this life and the promise of eternal life. It reads like this. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. The man's name was Limelech, and his, name, his wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. 
There were Ephratites. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness of you as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I am going, am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried to them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you, where, would I, where, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, She stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes from Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse 16. Paul and Silas are miraculously freed from prison, as you'll see. They've been praying and singing hymns to God. We can, we can respond to being mistreated in the same way. Listen to how it reads. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money by her owners, for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who, you are telling, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, They were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. 
At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll be saved, you and your household. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the reading of the gospel lesson. And in this gospel reading from Luke, Jesus commends the faith of of a Samaritan leper who alone gives, gives thanks for his healing. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and, Gal- and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise, and go. Faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Be God. Please be seated for the singing of the message hymn. and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's read the text as printed in the bulletin today. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, 
What must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You and all household. Questions. Questions. The world is full of questions. We all have questions, right? Every single day. Why? What? When? Where? How? I think the Lord is gracious when he says, trust in me. <laughs> Do not worry about tomorrow. Today has enough worry of its own. The jailer in the story today asks the most important question. But he assumes that he must do something. What's his question? What must I do to be saved? In this case, he got a very clear answer from Paul the Apostle. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Do you recall the rich young ruler who went away sad because he did not want to part with any of his wealth? Jesus told his disciples that it would be better or easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter heaven. The disciples then wondered, well, who can be saved? Jesus wanted the disciples to know that salvation did not depend on them or us. So Jesus said, he looked in them and said, with man, it's impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Well, today's theme is the jailer's question. What must I do to be saved? It is a question, I think, of desperation on the part of the jailer. And the answer reveals God's plan of salvation through Christ alone. But first, this question of desperation. A little context, we are in Acts chapter 16, the, the second half of it, so to speak. Last week, Timothy joins Paul and Silas as they reach the city of Lystra. Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia begging him to come and help them. So they cross the sea and arrive at the Roman colony of Philippi, the leading city in Macedonia. Paul wrote a letter years later to the church at Philippi called Philippians. Well, they went down to the river to pray, like the song that was sung last week. And they shared the gospel with some women, and one of them was a woman named Lydia. And it was from her and her friends that a church was birthed. Well, in today's reading, we see Paul and Timothy and Silas, they are still in Philippi. They haven't moved on. And they went back to the place of prayer by the river. But this time, they ran into a slave girl who had a spirit who was able to predict the future. And Paul cast the spirit out of her. Well, the owners of this slave girl were upset. Her demonic gift produced money for the owners. Paul had just evaporated their income stream. They had Paul and Silas seized and brought to the authorities. False accusations were hurled at them. They were severely beaten and thrown into prison. What is going on? Don't they know who Paul is? Don't they know that he is teaching the message of salvation with God through Christ? Don't they get it? Well, no, they don't get it. And many today do not get it. What did Paul and Silas do? Did they wallow in the prison and say, why? Why? After all, we're innocent. It doesn't say what they did, but it does say they did this. Once in the prison, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. The other prisoners were listening. And God's miracle begins. A great earthquake occurs. The prison doors fling open. 
the chains fall off and the prisoners are free. This happened to Peter earlier in Acts and he was led by an angel and walked out. This time, no. This time, the prisoners stayed. Well, the jailer saw the doors opened, assumed the worst, the prisoners had escaped, and his reaction was to commit suicide. You see, there were rules and expectations of jailers in that era. If he had lost his prisoners, he faced execution. But more than that, his honor, his honor would have been stripped from him. He would have lived a life of shame. He would never be able to live it down. But the prisoners hadn't escaped. Paul stops him from harm. He says, everyone is still here. Don't. See this jailer? I think he's desperate. There's no way out for him. No way to save himself. He's heard all night long these hymns, these prayers. The prisoners are listening. Assume he is. There's no way out of this situation except death. It's desperate. Well, today I think many, many often come to God out of desperation with all the attractions and distractions of our world. God can be forgotten. But when things seem to fall apart, we start asking the why questions of God, don't we? When the world is crashing down, you cry out, God, oh God, help. If you're real, please help me. But the Lord is always there. He's always listening. We don't have to wait for desperate times to cry out and be close to God. He's always listening. Psalm 142 puts it like this. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Those words all assume that God is real and there and listening and able. Why do we wait until desperate times? Well, I think our society promises the best. We're caught up in thinking wealth, money, it brings happiness. Good health means everything. Now, there is truth. There's a little bit of truth in those things. Money, wealth, health. But the real truth is that this world can easily turn our attention from what should be our real focus. Our focus on God and His saving power. On Jesus, our Redeemer. The Apostle Peter writes about the draws of this world when he writes about people who promise freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a person is a slave to whatever has mastered them. Let Jesus master you. Be his slave. The world promises much but ends up ends up only making slaves of unsuspecting souls as we follow the whims and desires and the winds. But why, why, why does this happen? Why do people avoid God and fall away from God? Well, I think there's one single thing, and we did it earlier in this service. It's our sinfulness. It's our separation from God. We may try to dismiss our sinful nature, but it's there. It separates us from God. It infects and affects every living and breathing soul. We can't make ourselves good enough. There's no escape. Since Adam and Eve's first sin, all of us inherit that sinful nature. Isaiah, the prophet, writes this. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Even all those things that we might consider as righteous are tainted by our sinful nature. 
But let's come back to the jailer's question. What must I do to be saved? His question of desperation. Well, interestingly, you know, the day before Paul and Silas were thrown into prison, this man had a normal job guarding prisoners. Now, he is close to dead. Face to face with two singing prisoners who worshiped God at midnight and did not escape when the opportunity arose. He must have been dumbfounded. What is going on? Well, let me read what happens next as we see God's answer to this man's desperation. This is Acts 16, beginning in verse 29. The jailer called for lights. I'm sure not the electric kind. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. As this jailer seeks out an answer, Paul is willing and able to provide God's answer of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus. This is what will save you. They spoke the word of the Lord to the jailer and his household. And that word of the Lord contained the truth about Jesus' sacrifice for us. And this truth would set them free. Paul and Silas explained God's plan of salvation to him. His whole household heard and they believed. The result was miraculous. The jailer's entire household was baptized. And in that household, there was great joy and rejoicing. It's interesting to note that the jailer washed Paul's wounds and Silas's wounds. And I'm sure during that time, Paul must have said, do you know what this water also can do? It can provide forgiveness of sin as you are baptized. I'm sure Paul did not stay silent. But notice the hand of God in this whole thing. The jailer did not go to work. He did not go out of his way to find God. God found him in the depths of that prison, in the depths of his prison. Paul and Silas were in prison. This seemed unfair. But God's plan set the prisoners free. But they didn't leave. God's plan was that the word of the Lord, the answer of salvation, would be brought to those who did not seek him. God's grace saves mankind. It saves us from destruction. Years later, Years later, Paul writes in the book of Romans, salvation does not depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Praise Jesus. The jailer's desperate question was answered in the word of the Lord. The power of God's holy word changed his life, changed his family. They heard, they listened, and God worked faith in their hearts. In this very same manner, God still makes believers out of unbelievers when they hear the truth of Jesus Christ. It is God's grace and the almighty power of his living word that performs these miracles. It isn't your efforts. We cannot take credit for our salvation. God is the one who even creates faith in us. See, Paul writes in the book of Titus, God saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
The power of God's grace comes to us through his word. It comes to us through his word. The power of divine forgiveness comes to believers through God's sacraments. In the Lord's Supper, the blood of Jesus covers our sins. In the Holy Sacrament of Baptism, the Lord cleanses our souls. Eternal salvation is so very important to God, He did not entrust the task to us. Praise Jesus for that. Rather, He entrusted it to His Son, who faithfully obeyed God in all things. He allowed Himself to be crucified and to die. He was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. And he sent his spirit to lead and guide into each believer. And he works faith in us. Our world is far from perfect today, in case you haven't noticed. We can never obey enough. We can never pay enough. We can never pray enough to save ourselves. Instead, God has placed a responsibility for the answer of salvation squarely on his shoulders. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that nobody can boast. When you're in a desperate situation, an unfair situation, perhaps even because of your own bad choices, Think about Paul and Silas in prison and pray. Sing praises to God, even if you don't feel like it, especially if you don't feel like it. Hymn 819 in our hymnal, Sing praise to God, the highest good, has been on my mind a lot this week. Pick a hymn, memorize it, sing it, let it be on your lips. Let people hear you sing it. What's that? I haven't heard that song before. See, God has brought you from death to life by believing in the Lord Jesus. Every day you can constantly rejoice and praise God for what He has done for your eternal salvation. Your life is seen and heard by those around you. So I do pray that the Lord Jesus would be on your lips as you speak of him and as you sing praises to his name and that your actions would be clearly visible that you love him. Amen. Amen. And now let's sing together the offertory hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This?
As you're able, please rise for our confession of faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one Christian Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge the baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, by your Holy Spirit, teach us constantly to pray, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, and to trust that you have cleansed us by his blood. Grant that we, like the former leper, would raise our voices of praise in joyful response to your loving care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our o Lord, have mercy upon those whom you have called to proclaim your holy gospel. Preserve them from useless entanglements. Fortify them in faithfulness when they must suffer. And remind them always that your word is living and active. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our o Lord, if we are faithless, you remain faithful. Remember those who baptize, who you baptized, who have departed from the faith. Grant them penitent hearts, that they might obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, your servant Ruth faithfully cared for Naomi in her solitude in later years. Bless all adult children with wisdom and compassion as they care for their aging parents and give their parents a humble spirit to accept needed assistance. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, guide and protect those who defend us, those who preserve order against the threat of terror, and those who sit in judgment over evildoers, that justice and peace may prevail in our land. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our oh Lord, you are the God of all help. You hear the cries of the righteous, and you deliver them from their troubles and fears. Remember all who cry to you for help, especially those in our families and our friendships who are hurting, that we name in our hearts now. O Lord, grant them peace and healing according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.